So we are in this uh, interesting time of uh, the rule of King Hezekiah. And uh, I think last time we kind of <coughs> roared into Hezekiah and did take a quick brief look at him. And uh, as you know, uh, names are important. And so we probably need to take just at least a second to look at this guy, Hezekiah, and say, uh, what is it about even his name that God has recorded that might be important to us? And there's some things you may remember, we've learned about when you look at these names and the English spelling of them, there's some, some sounds in the parts of them that you can actually pick up and go, oh, I think this has something to do with. And one of them is, when you look at the ending of that word, what do you hear? Ayah. Yeah. yeah, especially. <coughs> Which is, the, the Hebrew in that is capital... <coughs> which is the word that was not pronounced or spoken out loud in Hebrew because it represents God. This is Yahweh, is the way we would pronounce it. Of course, there's no vowels in Hebrew. You're all aware of their unique spelling system that the vowels you had to figure out. And so when you look at Hebrew script and you see little, that you'll see the, all the little squiggles and, the, that, and then sometimes you'll see these little lines or dots or things above them, those are the vowel pointings that were added later that helped you translate what those things said. And so the original would have had just consonants and the reader has to sort those out. And of course, the other fun thing about reading ancient Hebrew and the reason you go, why do all these scholars have so much trouble trying to figure it out? Is in the ancient Hebrew, it goes from this side to this side, no breaks between words. Wow. Just a whole string of consonants, and it's up to the reader <coughs> to figure out where the breaks in the words and everything are. So, and some of the, the characters are so similar, it's easy to see where a trans or transposer could, someone could get the wrong little squiggle, and it changes the whole word. So, that's part. So there we have that on the other side. So then we got this half of it to try to figure out what does that mean. And uh, since I don't know anything, I went. It comes from uh, the word hazak. And hazak means to become strong or courageous. So this is uh, strong or courageous. And you connect that up with God, and it kind of comes backwards. So it's God's strength, God's courage is the name of Hezekiah. Makes total sense, clear as mud, right? So this is the guy, and his, his mother's name is Abby, or Abby, and you go, what are you going to make of that? Three letters. Oh my gosh. Well, you know this one because you've seen it, and it says that we call out to him saying, Abba, Father. So this is Father. And what are you going to make out of one little big I? Well, it's, it speaks of, oh, this is like my father. So it points somehow back to her dad. And, and who he was, perhaps. Uh, maybe it was the this, I see this little girl and reminds me of <coughs> father or something interesting. And this, you'll notice if you go looking at names in the Old Testament, just look up a bunch of uh, names. And there's kind of a cool website I stumbled on that you can actually type in what's the meaning of, and it'll give you every Hebrew name in the Bible. You just click on it and it'll break all the etymology out and the letters and tell you the whole schmear about them. Uh, but this is a part of a whole bunch of other names, like Abijah and things like that. Add in the endings you want. They'll take this part and tack on an additional name to it. So, so somewhere in here uh, in, is an indication of this Hezekiah, because we know that his father was an absolute wreck as a king and spiritual leader in the nation. 
that it just destroyed the place. And remember last time when, when he took the throne, that down here in Jerusalem, the tumbleweeds were rolling through the deserted uh, temple area with the doors closed and barred, the uh, temple filled with uh, excess baggage and leftover stuff and is being used as a storehouse. The priesthood was pretty much in shambles. Uh, the brazen altar had been moved off to one side and this newfangled altar put in its place that the king had been. So it's a real wreck. And last time we saw that he recognized that and immediately in his first year reign they went and cleaned out the temple and then he started the process of getting priests back up to speed and the Levites and bringing the faithful ones in and starting to rebuild all of that. And we saw them go through all the feasts. So last time we reviewed all the feasts and what they were and how they were. And so you can go back and get the notes, right? Oh, okay. Sorry about that. Maybe if you have the video, you can get the video from last week and go through and, uh, and you can catch up on what all those those uh, offerings that they did, the sin offering, the burnt offering, and what all those meant. But basically, it was cleanup time for the nation from a sin perspective. And they went through and they consecrated, which is another word we need to look at just a little bit, when it tells us that they were consecrated. We use that term all the time. What does it mean? Because we will see in here where they didn't have enough priests that were consecrated. And the Levites had done a better job of being ready than the priests. And what did it mean not to have a priest consecrated? So the best way I can describe it, if I have a dish out on the front porch right now, in fact, as I left the house, there's a nice cooking dish out on the front porch sitting down there next to the dog dish. And you can guess what it was for. It was the leftovers that my faithful friend got to enjoy. Now, in order to use that cooking dish again for our use, I'm going to consecrate that for that use, which means we're going to take it in, stick it in the dishwasher, and scorch that thing, and clean it up with detergent and hot water, and it will then be consecrated to use to cook for human consumption. And that's really what the word means, to take something and make it in a condition which it will be appropriate for the use that is intended. So what that means to consecrate a priest means to take that soiled pot, clean it up ceremonially so that they can stand in the presence of a holy, sinless God, run him through the dishwasher, if you will, and sterilize him and get him ready and clean off the sin was the, what the ceremonies were designed to do was represent the sin that God removed by the sacrifice and that's why remember when the, they brought in the sacrifice and they went and put their hand on that on the head of that sacrifice that symbolized my sin is here I put it over there and that animal dies for me so that's what happens when they were consecrated. So they've been through that process and they've uh, gotten a bunch of the priests cleaned up and now the next thing pops up. So that happened in, his, in the first month of the year. Am I losing you in the garbage yet? In his first year, when he came to the first month, this is what he did, is he went in and we saw all those, those cleanup jobs, the consecration of the nation that happened. And now they're rolling up towards the second month, and Hezekiah being the man that he was, said, uh, we've got a problem. And uh, we, we've got to... Uh, I'll make find myself. <coughs> In my brain, there we go. Yeah. I'm chapter all the way up to chapter 30 now. We finished the burnt offerings, and uh, Hezekiah gets to thinking about what is important in the Jewish calendar that we need to be concerned about. Passover is important, and that gets us to all the Jewish feasts 
not only has the temple been shut down and everything's they haven't been observing any of the things that Leviticus and had laid out for them that they should do throughout the year. And the first one that comes up in chapter 30 is the Passover. So let's read about the situation and then what we're going to do, time allowing, is go back and kind of review the feast that they were supposed to do and talk a little about the Passover and what that meant for the nation. So let's pick it up, chapter 30, verse 1. Now Hezekiah sent to all Israel and Judah and wrote letters also to Ephraim and Manasseh that they should come to the house of the Lord at Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover of the Lord God of Israel. For the king and his princes and all the assembly in Jerusalem had decided to celebrate the Passover in the second month since they could not celebrate it at that time because the priests had not consecrated themselves in sufficient numbers nor had the people been gathered to Jerusalem. Thus the thing was right in the sight of the king and all the assembly. Well Passover, just to explain, was supposed to happen in the first month, the month Nisan was to be the first month of the year for them. It's the beginning of their year, and it's actually in March and April, appropriate that we should be talking about it now, about this time of year, they would celebrate the Passover. It was the beginning of the year for them to be done in the first month. And early on in the celebrating of this and the laying out of it, a bunch of guys came in to Moses and said, Moses, we've got a problem. We just had a death in the family. We've had to deal with the dead body of this person and take care of the burial and everything. Here we are in Passover, and we aren't consecrated, we're not clean because of handling the dead body. What do we do? We can't celebrate Passover. And Moses said, let me go check with the boss. And he went in, and he talked to the Lord, and the Lord said, they can do it in the second month. <clears throat> and there's a possibility of a mini Passover for those who are for some reason not of their own making, Unable to participate here, we could go and have a second Passover on the second month, and that would be okay. So they would get to do it in the month Sivan that came following this one. So that's what the nation has said. We weren't in a position, we weren't consecrated, we weren't clean, we weren't able to do it. Let's do it now. Let's get the whole nation back up to speed. So that's what he's talking about in verses 3 and 4 there. So in verse 5, they established a decree to circulate a proclamation throughout all Israel from Beersheba even to Dan, that they should come to celebrate the Passover to the Lord God of Israel at Jerusalem. For they had not celebrated it in great numbers as it was prescribed. And the couriers went throughout all Israel and Judah with the letters from the hand of the king and his princes even according to the command of the king, saying, O sons of Israel, return to the Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, that he may return to those of you who escaped and are left by the hand of the kings of Assyria. And do not be like your fathers or your brothers who were unfaithful to the Lord God of their fathers, so that he made them a horror as you see. Now do not stiffen your neck like your fathers, but yield to the Lord and enter his sanctuary, which he has consecrated forever, and serve the Lord your God, that his burning anger may turn away from you. For if you return to the Lord, your brothers and your sons will find compassion before those who have led them captive, and will return to this land. For the Lord your God is gracious and compassionate, and will not turn his face away from you if you return to him. So there was the proclamation, and the couriers passed from city to city through the country of Ephraim and Manasseh, and as far as Zebulun, but they laughed them to scorn and mocked them. Nevertheless, some of the men of Asher, Manasseh, and Zebulun humbled themselves and came to Jerusalem. And the hand of God was also on Judah to give them one heart to do what the king and the princes commanded by the word of the Lord. So they've sent it out, and they've sent it not just through Judah, but they sent it over the whole thing, all the way up into the land of Zebulun up here, and uh, said, y'all come. You've been through the ringer down here. That should have been a huge heads up. And amazing. 
that the heart and heart and hearts of those who remained in the land, so many of them said, laughed them. They thought that was the stupidest thing they had ever heard. And they made fun of the couriers and made fun of the king. And why should we even think about that? Really sad. They've just been devastated by Assyria. You remember that the guys have come in and attacked here. They've taken out this whole area and they've taken a whole bunch of them and packed them off. And so they've been exported and they still think that's really stupid. Why would we want to go to Jerusalem? And all those years have been documented. The, the other thing that a lot of scholars believe is that the, says the Passover hasn't been celebrated as a large group. A lot of them believe it hasn't been that way since the divided kingdom. So that's 215 years that they have not celebrated the Passover as a nation, the way it was prescribed. <coughs> so this is a big deal. It's really a big deal. So let's pick it up. We'll try to see if I can get quickly through about verse 23 at least. And then we'll see if we can squeeze in a little bit about the feast and the Passover. So many people were gathered in verse 13 at Jerusalem to celebrate the Feast of Unleavened Bread in the second month, a very large assembly. And they arose and removed the altars which were in Jerusalem, and they also removed all the incense altars and cast them into the book of Kidron. And they slaughtered the Passover lambs in the 14th of the second month. And the priests and Levites were ashamed of themselves and consecrated themselves and brought burnt offerings to the house of the Lord. And they stood at their stations after their custom according to the law of Moses, the man of God. The priests sprinkled the blood which they received from the hand of the Levites. For there were many in the assembly who had not consecrated themselves. Therefore the Levites were over the slaughter of the Passover lambs for everyone who was unclean in order to consecrate them to the Lord. For a multiple of the people, even many from Ephraim and Manasseh, Issachar and Zebulun had not purified themselves. Yet they ate the Passover, otherwise than prescribed. For Hezekiah prayed for them, saying, May the good Lord pardon everyone who prepares his heart to seek God, the Lord God of his fathers, though not according to the purification rules of the sanctuary. So the Lord heard Hezekiah and healed the people. And the sons of Israel present in Jerusalem celebrated the Feast of Unleavened Bread for seven days with great joy. And the Levites and the priests praised the Lord day after day with loud instruments to the Lord. Then Hezekiah spoke encouragingly to all the Levites who showed good insight in the things of the Lord. So they ate for the appointed seven days, sacrificing peace offerings and giving thanks to the Lord God of their fathers. Then the whole assembly decided to celebrate the feast another seven days. So they celebrated the seven days with joy. And you're all going... Whoopee! That sounds confusing. It is. So, let me see if I can sort through some of this for you. In about the 10 minute quick version here. That's my handy dandy. So, kind of, sort of, kind of. Easy. We've got a whole list of feasts that were prescribed in. Uh, there's a couple of verses, uh, Leviticus 23 is probably the, the main one where there, these are outlined, and then the Passover goes all the way back to Exodus chapter 12 when it actually occurred, so that will pick that one up there, but I want to first kind of just run you through real fast the whole schedule, because the year had a whole schedule of feasts that they did, the first being the Passover, and it was in Nisan, at N, believe it or not. And this is, and it was done on the 14th of the month. And this is March to A R April, somewhere in there. And you can see the connection with, which is a conglomeration of Passover and spring and all the bunnies and eggs and stuff all come from those kind of and the phase of the moon. Not the, the, the full moon phase and all that. 
So within that, we have unleavened bread was mentioned. Which was the same time, and that is the 15th through the 21st of that same period of time. And then we have first fruits, which happens, in the, I think it depends, they're a little divided. About, some say it's here, which is the same time, or possibly the next month on the 6th which is more like June, May or June. And uh, this connects to barley harvest for all you farmers out there. So it's, it's one of the two. It somehow appears that it follows right after this other one. And then these are all spring. And then in the fall, you start the next batch which are these <coughs> trumpets. And that happens in Tishri on the first and second, and it is September, October. Then we've got atonement. Oh, you know this one because you hear it in the news all the time, don't you? I O N. Yom Kippur, and that's also in Tishri, it's about the 10th, which is September, October, and then there's booths, or tabernacles, and I call it, sometimes called ingathering, and you can't read my writing so you have to take my word for that which is about the 15th through the 21st at the same time of year, which kind of ends their, uh, the Levitical ones. You can add to that uh, uh, the dedication or Hanukkah that you're familiar with that came along later. That was in the month Chislev or whatever it is. It's winter time, November, December, celebrated for eight days that did not come from Leviticus, but that came from the Maccabean revolt when they retook and re-cleansed and brought, put the temple back together after the Syrians had ruled them. And there was that Antiochus Epiphanes was the Syrian king that they overthrew. So some of these names may sound familiar. So that's where Hanukkah came from. Yes? Kind of interesting that that one is different than... All the rest of their stuff. Yeah, and it's interesting if you go through them, there are feasts and fasts about this long all through this period for all kinds of other things that have happened in their history. So if you want to go like the Unger's Bible Dictionary and just look up the, the, the feasts, there's a, you know, there are celebrations that have a ton of added ones. They had one for Esther. That was Purim. That's the other one, Purim, or Lot's. And, and that is uh, in the month of Adar, which is February, March. We've just been through. And that was this, uh, from Esther 9 where they uh, remember evil King Haman was going to get rid of all the Jews. And they turned it on its head and said, because the, the idea of lots, the lot was going to be cast for you. And you would go, you know, lose your head. And they turned it around and said anybody that would persecute the Jews, the lot was cast on them. And so they have that Purim or Lots that was also a major festival later celebrated based on that when they were in captivity. But this is the main uh, group of them that are really significant. And, and I kind of wanted to, uh, uh, we're going to run out of time quick, but just so that you can see this annual pattern and what it means because we're coming up to that Easter time. So you get the picture up here. You have the death of Christ portrayed. The lamb that would have the shed blood that would be put on the doorpost. So if you had your door, remember this is the doorway into that home in Egypt. There's the ground under there. And when you sacrifice that lamb at twilight, which was... Somewhere between, if you listen to the scholars, they'll tell you they believe it's after it tipped over noon, so after the sun went past its 
highest point in the sky and before sunset. And most guys, including Josephus, tend to say it was around 3 p.m., so middle of the afternoon, is when that lamb is slaughtered. No way. 3 p.m.? Around 3 p.m. Isn't that the same time twice or something? Amazing, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> really interesting. There you are. So the lamb was killed, and the blood was placed here, here, and here on the doorway. And if you were inside the home where the blood was placed on the entrance to that home, you were passed over. Everyone else that was in a home that wasn't protected by that lost their firstborn. You were saved. You were saved by the application of the blood of the door where everyone was at. The unleavened bread celebrated for seven days is part of the Passover. The lamb was selected and then they were kept. It was selected on the tenth and then part of the process was you went through the house and I guess it became quite a thing in later tradition in Jewish families, maybe even today, that some leaven is hidden in the home somewhere and you go through the home and you find all the leaven and you clean it all out and the home can have no leaven in it and you eat unleavened bread, hardtack, you know, for all those days, flat breads, whatever, but no leaven whatsoever. And for seven days, you eat unleavened bread. Was leaven is symbolic of sin? Leaven is symbolic of sin. And if you remember, Christ lived a sinless life, and he was part of the men's study we had here a week or so, a few weeks ago, was showing how Christ was sinless. He did not sin, and he had no sin nature. And the whole idea that you've cleaned this house out of sin, and his, uh, so you have his sinless life. And then you have the first fruits at the end of that. And the first fruit was the first sheaves of the barley harvest that came off in the Jordan Valley and some of the other plains, the lower elevations. The barley harvest came off and you took in the very first <coughs> cutting, a bundle of that, before you did any other harvest. And you offered that up in the temple as what they called a wave offering. And the first fruits of that Build that right. There you see the resurrection of Christ, who is said to be the first fruits of many to come. So there you've got that. Then you have uh, the, the, in the fall, you have first the Feast of Trumpets, which uh, appears to point towards the uh, regathering of Israel. So you regather Israel. After you've been through this in the spring, the trumpet goes out, you regather Israel, you have uh, the atonement, which is the annual, uh, what do I want to call that, the, what did I put down here? You've got the, the substitutionary sacrifice made here in the Day of Atonement when uh, Israel's gathered, they have the sacrifice that's made for them, that cleans them. And then you have this thing of booze, which re goes back towards when God led them out of the land and they lived in tents all that time. It points to that. But it's also this regathering of folks. If you look at it, this is like a reunion with, back with, the, with Christ. So... And it's really interesting, and I think this is the one, I, I forgot to put it on my notes here, but as you're going through these, these feasts, this is unleavened bread up there. When they did got down to here, I better double check myself, guess what they put in their bread? Yeast. Yeast. You brought loaves in with leaven in them. And you go, I thought leaven was bad, you couldn't have it. I think, I don't know, but to me, that's pointing to, who is being regathered? That's, it's saying 
It looks to me like it's pointing to up here we saw the sinless lamb, the one who has sacrificed the substitutionary, and now those leaven lumps out there are acceptable as offerings because the price has been paid up there. Does that make sense? It's like heaven everything is perfect and wonderful. Yeah, it's perfect and wonderful. And, and while there's not going to be a sin in heaven, it will be removed. But it's like you can gather up that loaf with the leaven in it. Now it's been made. It's turned into that which is acceptable. So you got, I realize this is like the super, super short. We should spend about 10 lessons on it. But I wanted you to at least see that just a little bit. The other thing that we don't have time to do today, but you notice that mentioned in there, you might just caught that one little blip about the singing and all that that was going on. Well, that is really, really important. We talked about that at our last uh, time we did a... Oh, I just got to take it out. Sorry about that, folks. Our last uh, communion service we talked about that singing part, because it says when the Lord and His disciples had their last meal together, having sung a song, they went out. And you kind of blow over that and think, oh, they sang a little praise song or just sang together or something. Well, it was more significant than that. When you did the Passover, it was traditional to do the Egyptian... How loud? Which is... The Egyptian praise psalm. And it came, consists of Psalm 113 through Psalm 118. And at the beginning you would do 113 through 115, I believe. 14. Sorry about that. Those first two were sung, read, and then the last 115. <coughs> through 1, 18 were sung at the end of the Passover celebration. So it was the two bookends that were part of that Passover celebration. So when you go and you read through these, that's what was part of remembering who God was. And if I, I was hoping we would have time today to finish our time reading that because that is gathers up so much of what we're trying to say. Maybe next time we'll do it. We'll see. We'll think about that. Go through, read those. With this in mind, that you sang this first, and then you sang this last. And the one thing I want to leave with you, in 118 verse 25, when you read verse 25, there's a Hebrew word in there that you don't see in your English. 